All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, special panel on cybersecurity. Today, we're going to be talking about kind of the uh, transition or the uh, the space in between medical device manufacturers and uh, healthcare delivery organizations. We're going to be saying MDMs and HDOs for the remainder of the talk in most cases. Um, and we're really talking about the interactions between these two organizations and how regulators and standards and things like that can help when considering cybersecurity for medical devices. Uh, we've got a very stacked panel today, so I'm very excited to get diving into who's here today. So we're going to start out with Sam. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Sam Jocks. I am the Vice President of Clinical Engineering at McLaren Health, which is a 15 hospital system in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, and I am considered one of those HDOs, the healthcare delivery organization. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. Uh, let's go over to Chris. Hi, my name is Chris Gates. I'm the Director of Product Security at Valentium. Uh, I have some 50 years of new product development in the medical device industry experience, and I've been with Valentium now for five years, and we help, uh, we're a registered manufacturer, so we're definitely in the MDM camp, but we also uh, consult with many, many uh, other MDMs, helping them with their various needs, from firmware to mobile apps to cybersecurity. Perfect. Uh, Ken? Yes, I'm uh, Ken Hoime from, uh, I'm a senior fellow at Boston Scientific in our product, uh, global product cybersecurity group. Um, been working in medical device security for close to 20 years now, uh, anywhere from embedded you know, pacemakers, defibrillators out to patient monitoring systems and now have a global overview of our processes for developing secure medical devices at Boston Scientific. Perfect. Axel, you're up next. Yes, my name is Axel Worth. I'm the Chief Security Strategist at Medcrypt. Um, have actually spent my entire career uh, on the topic of medical devices, uh, spanning 40 years now, uh, and the last 10 years specific with a focus on medical device security. All right, and last but certainly not least, Kevin. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin Fu, the Acting Director of Medical Device Cybersecurity in uh, the US FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Perfect. I'm, I'm very excited to have everyone on the panel today. Uh, most of you, I'm pretty sure you all know each other already. Um, for the viewers who might not be familiar with it, Amy has a regular column uh, in which cybersecurity experts contribute their cyber insights. Um, and talk about certain things. So most of you have been panelists. In some cases, uh, you have contributed in other ways, like you're on the editorial board, et cetera. Um, but I understand that a lot of the conversations that you have are about you know, this transition or when we, the consideration of the full life cycle of a medical device and why considering that suddenly creates this transition, this overlap between uh, MDMs and SDOs. So I kind of wanted to start with that just on a really softball, easy beginner question here is, you know, what do you mean when we're talking about the full life cycle of a medical device? So anybody wants to jump in first? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. I think <clears throat> at the cradle to grave is what is, is referred to. I think if you look at the uh, system engineering uh, processes, you talk about concept phase, which is when you first start imagining what a device might be. And mm -hmm. just as it's been very traditional in medical device manufacturers to early on consider potential hazards, um, we're evolving now where the potential security risks and their potential impact on hazards has to be all the way back at that concept phase. Clearly, all through the design and development, you have to be considering secure architectures, do threat modeling. <clears throat> you have to consider security testing in, in the testing phase. And then in the transition to the HDO, there needs to be clear communication on what the security expectations are. Um, and then the ongoing challenges that while it's fielded to be able to keep it patched and updated. And then I think what industry is starting to wrestle with is given that there will be software obsolescence in some cases, what is the end of life processes and how do we support them from a security perspective? But it really has to be, you know, from the point you think about it until the point you take the last one out of the field. Great. And that's uh, so true, Ken. Uh, unfortunately, over the last 15 years of doing this, I see too many who come to me and say, hey, I just submitted a pre-market approval for our new medical device. 
And uh, FDA came back with uh, 24 questions on cybersecurity. We don't even know how to spell cybersecurity. You know, help us make us go. And it's like, this is going to be painful, okay? Because you're waiting to the last part of it here. So the security is not ever going to be as good as it should have been. The cost to you, the delayed entry into the marketplace to go back and redesign things and put it in. So you've you've found all your design vulnerabilities. You've found all of your critical software implementation vulnerabilities and your third-party software components and addressed all these. You wanted to be in in the marketplace in 90 days, and guess what? You're not gonna be, okay? Now, what I have seen change here, and I, I'm, i for some reason, it's the executive order here uh, that happened last year, has been a godsend. All of a sudden now, instead of those kind of clients, I'm getting ones who are coming to me and saying, we wanna implement a complete governance system. Define for us the roles, the responsibilities, the activities, all the artifacts that need to be created. How does this work? And it's like, I see that as a huge maturity step in our industry. And I've currently got four Fortune 100 companies that I'm doing this with right now, okay? This isn't just a one-off. This is something that's changed. And it's a great sea change that I, I just think speaks wonders for it because I'm not there just to fix the one incarnation. I'm there to fix your, your process, your company, and make this as something you just do as part of your normal development activities. It's not a special carve out. It's just more work. Are you saying thank you, Vladimir Putin? Uh, no, no, I, I'm <laughs> saying thank you, uh, President Biden, for the executive order on infrastructure cybersecurity. Uh, I think that really got a lot of people's attention. And and even though the FDA has certainly not been quiet, I mean, you know, Jess, Jessica Wilkerson, uh, somebody named Kevin Fu, uh, tends to get out there and advertise and socialize a bit. But for some reason, it doesn't always reach the right ears. I'm absolutely amazed how many people I talk to and they go, well, what's a threat model? And it's like, my God, man, where have you been? What shows do you go to? How have I missed you? Okay, <laughs> literally, I, I wanna know, you know, where do you go for your professional education to keep up that I've missed? Because I put myself everywhere talking about this, trying to educate, trying to bring everybody up to a level. Axel and I wrote a frigging book together to try to do this called medical device cybersecurity. And it's like, how do we do this uh, and get to these right people? Well, apparently that executive order did get to a lot of the right people. So kudos, I'm I'm really glad they did it. Well, Chris, I, I'd like to echo on, you know, you're talking from the manufacturer side, you've seen a lot of motion. I'll say from the HDO side, we've also seen a lot of movement right in the past couple of years as well. There's a lot more questions being asked on the HDO side. And I will point out from Ken's uh, Ken's response, right? A lot of the manufacturers think about the the total life cycle ending at right end of life, right? You know, when they're going to stop supporting the device. But we've got to have a plan to continue supporting that device after end of life within the HDO until literally, right, we throw it in the garbage heap. Right. Uh, you know, and it's and it's physically gone from our environment. And so, you know, I applaud both of you guys because, right, we have started thinking about things from the very, very beginning in ideation all the way to the very, very end, which is really what we all mean by by a total full life cycle right. of what the medical device is. Well, I always tell my clients, if you're coming to me during concept or early design phase, we're going to be best friends. If you want to ship next week, you're going to hate me. <laughs> okay, It's just that simple. So, yeah, it's it's a whole different process and it's easy to do once you incorporate it into your life cycle. It's a pain to try to do it at the end. Well, you can. Yeah. So I think that, well, Kevin, you go. Uh, sure. Well, I was just going to double down on the threat modeling. Uh, I have to agree. And this, this is why FDA uh, has been so vocal in uh, providing educational resources through this new uh, playbook for threat modeling. Uh, it's just would be very difficult for anyone to submit uh, a 510K or a PMA or so on and so forth if there's no threat model that's refutable and meaningful. Uh, because how do you make a scientific claim if you don't follow the basic scientific process for um, for cybersecurity, which begins with a threat model? Um, and be glad to comment on the executive order too, but uh, uh, Axel uh, had a had a follow up there as well. Uh, sure. So two quick things on I think the challenges we as an collectively as an industry need to overcome with regards to that that complete life cycle. I think one is we need to recognize that there's actually a number of independent li life cycles that are loosely connected, and we need to take care that we that we sync them up. 
uh, right? There is a supplier to the medical device manufacturer. There's the manufacturer um, development life cycle. There is the manufacturer's maintenance life cycle. And then lastly, there's the life cycle of a device within the HDOS, as Sam was pointing out. Um, they, those four wheels spin at different frequencies, right? And the manufacturer thinks about the device and the product line as a whole, whereas the HDO thinks about the individual physical device, right? The manufacturer ends of lives a type of infusion pump, the entire platform. The HDO throws one pump away because the screen is cracked, but keeps the other 900. Right? So th they are very different dynamics within the different life cycles. Um, that is the first point. The second point I wanted to make um, where we all need to spend some more time and work is that life cycle management is not new, right? We've been doing this in this industry for decades, but cybersecurity life cycles are very different. And as all of you pointed out before, there are some very intrinsic and, and, and tricky aspect around cybersecurity that need to be well managed in order to actually succeed with a life cycle. Recently, there was an Amy blog article that was very good on this topic, and it made reference to an HISAC working group on life cycle, and it used the rings diagram, which I think is the most comprehensive description of what that life cycle looks like. Of course, I'm biased because I was in that working group, but <laughs> and and Axel was the chairman uh, of that working group. But I think it really does show this, the, the continuous processes that have to go on. And this is not the same business you had as an MDM 20 years ago. There are new things that have to go on asynchronously with other activities associated with it, like your approved supplier list and post-market surveillance and how you're going to do customer communications and all this stuff. These are activities that comes as a real shock to a lot of MDMs, believe it or not. That's great. I, I do so, want to step back for a quick second uh, so we could touch on what we did mention, which was the executive order that came up as a, a timeliness factor. You know, I also wanted to touch on, you know, just because of what's going on in Russia right now with the Ukrainian situation, um, the CISA and the FBI have both released uh, several advisories, basically warning HDOs, hey, you need to be extra vigilant right now because there has been a history of these kinds of attacks uh, that might bleed over into the U.S. or the rest of the world, et cetera. Um, Kevin, you, you did say you wanted to comment on that, so so please take the opportunity now. Sure. So um, just to, to level set, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone here is aware of the executive order, but for the for the viewers, uh, so Biden issued an executive order in May 2021 on uh, improving the nation's cybersecurity for for the nation's infrastructure, and it's 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 a lengthy EO. It's it's a good. Uh, I think I I think I recall a good forty pages or so, and it gets pretty technical, which is a little unusual for an executive order. Mm -hmm. Talks about S bomb, uh, for instance, uh, by name. Uh, talks about penetration testing um, and and some of the nuances of of security engineering. And so uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, or NIST. Uh, issued a call for public comments on a particular aspect of critical software. Uh, so FDA submitted a response, uh, and you can find this response on our cybersecurity landing page. If you just search for FDA cybersecurity, you'll probably find it in the first or second hit uh, at, at our Digital Health Center of Excellence. Uh, and this five-pager uh, goes into great detail about uh, past and present activities at FDA on improving uh, medical device cybersecurity, um, which is uh, very related to uh, uh, critical infrastructure software. And um, it, it also serves as a nice sort of uh, uh, cliff notes for pretty much every URL you could possibly need uh, to get a, a quick, you know, from zero to 60 on medical device security. Uh, it, it'll keep you busy for probably a few weeks if you choose to follow every URL. Uh, but I think it's a great starting point um, for somebody, for instance, new to medical device security on, on really understanding the culture uh, of uh, medical device security and the different ecosystems and stakeholders. Perfect. Thank you for that. And I, I should mention for anyone who is curious, who's watching, who may not know, Kevin mentioned SBOM. That's we're talking about software build of materials there. Uh, we'll probably talk a lot more about that in a little bit. Um, but I did want to transition to if we're talking to leadership of SDOs or MDMs, 
you know, it seems like you you all were talking about that there's more awareness that cybersecurity needs to be a full life cycle concern. Uh, but if we were making the the argument for cybersecurity as a full life cycle concern for both these organiz both these groups to be talking to one another and to realize that this is a concern that they need to take seriously, yeah, I, I was curious if there are any examples of known vulnerabilities or you know there was mention of uh, legacy products and things of that nature that would really bring it home for the leadership saying, hey, this is important. You need to take this seriously. Axel, I'm, I'm going to volunteer you there if you have any if you have any uh, examples or, or scenarios that you could propose. I think so with regards to vulnerabilities, I think the general trend we have seen over the last few years is that we have seen the disclosure of uh, deeply embedded and and pervasive vulnerabilities that really led to a mad scramble both on the MDM as well as on the HDO side to find affected devices to rule them out. Um, I mean, you know, log for shell most recently, but mm -hmm. before that we had, I mean, you name it, Urchin 11 and um, a long list of, of vulnerabilities that had the common characteristic of being deeply embedded in 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 devices uh, and widely used and uh, also widely used for many many years but so the number of affected devices in all of those cases in the cases with these pervasive vulnerabilities was very large and and, and consequently um, remediating and finding those devices was a significant challenge Right. I mean, we we have heard about Log for Shell that um, this particular software routine was used in ten thousands of projects, affecting millions and millions of devices. And some people have estimated that it will take years to root them out in in the field. Right. And and we need to really think hard about um, what can we as an industry do to do better with these high impact, pervasive vulnerabilities. Um, that seem to be coming out these days. Uh, these are not just one-off identify and knock them, you know, knock them off the list. These are things that affect many, many systems across your entire install base, and you need to sp spend months and years in finding and fixing them. So the, the complexity of what we're dealing with today, I think, is much higher than what it was a few years ago. Well, and we just saw, in fact, just today, they announced an NPM, the package manager, uh, 218 uh, attempts, uh, very craftily done, by the way, to impersonate other well-known packages so that as part of your build cycle, you would ingest one of these third-party software components and put it into your, your project and thereby compromise your project. It used to be the open source was you had a vulnerability that was a weakness that was accidentally created either because the, the programmer wasn't sufficiently talented or just didn't think about it or didn't look at it. Now what you're seeing is malicious intent. They're intentionally coming in and poisoning the well of your supply chain through confusion of naming, okay, through confusion in, the, in some package manager. All right? uh, there, you've really got to be careful now with your use of these third-party software components. And Chris, just, just for clarity on that, we're talking about components to a larger program that's going into a medical device or a network, is that right? Correct, correct, yeah. And as uh, using Axel's example, uh, Log4j is a, a logging library that's meant for Java programmers. Now, not a lot of embedded work is done in Java. There is some ubiquity, for instance, the people who make the Wi-Fi monitors and all that and their routers, they used it in their system, so they had this problem. But the thing of it is, as a Java programmer, you say, oh, yeah, my requirement says here on my, that I'm supposed to be working on here today is implement a logging system. Oh, yeah, Log4j, everybody knows that. Goes out and includes Log4j in your, in your package. And what you don't realize is you just included 294 sub projects, 294 transitive dependencies is the term that are in there that you don't even know. You don't know who moderates them. You don't know who contributed to them. What did they do? And any one of those could have been poisoned pilled intentionally. Last year, that was up 650% intentional. Okay. 650%. It's like really, really getting dangerous to use open source these days without thoroughly reviewing what it is you're getting, who's contributed to it, has the moderator change, changed recently, start running tests against it. It used to be we kind of carved out 
a niche part and said, oh yeah, that's that's third-party software component. We don't have to do any of that. No, you should be start running your 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 static analysis against this, doing some reviews of the code, looking for this kind of stuff. It's not safe anymore. So I'm going to bring it back to concept phase after we with our life cycle discussion. I think one of the errors that starts out at the beginning is that manufacturers may not fully understand how their devices are used by the IT and biomedical engineering departments. Mm -hmm. um, in, in many ways, you know, the FDA design control is going to direct you to talk about user needs, and the users tend to be viewed as the physicians or patients or nurses that use the equipment. And um, often the marketing departments at manufacturers don't even know who to talk to when it comes to how do you become a, a secure um, peer end system on a network uh, in the hospital. So gaining that understanding and make sure that your threat modeling and your system requirements reflect those needs by interacting with those people to understand how it is used. One of the areas that we that we have a subgroup working on in HISAC is looking at the issue of, of medical device scanning. Um, how does a hospital understand what's on their network and what its vulnerability position is? Well, typically vulnerability scanners are used, but often manufacturers don't consider that behavior and there have been examples of devices being tipped over when they get scanned and so there tends to be a don't scan medical devices philosophy which um, is not allowing the hospitals to manage them as they manage all the other pieces of equipment on the network so you know across that we need to start making sure we design these devices to live properly in the world that they are going to spend their life cycle in well, and I would agree 100% with what both Chris and Ken discussed, right? But I would I would like to point out that both of them are really talking about future products, right? Products that are currently in design that are not currently on the market. And so, right, part of the piece that we struggle with, right, Ken alluded to was I currently have thousands upon thousands of devices that were built and designed decades ago that currently live on my network, right? That we still have to figure out how to mitigate and manage, right? And these vulnerabilities that have been coming out, right? Um, you know, were built years ago and, and we struggle just like the manufacturers struggle to even identify what's actually affected, right? And if the manufacturers are having a hard time figuring out what's affected, we on the HDO side just sit and wait Right. And, and we're vulnerable to whatever the vulnerability is until right our upstream market figures it out and figures out whether or not it's actually a risk and we have to mitigate it and create a patch for it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the life cycle problem we talked about earlier is a very difficult problem to solve because it's great that we're going to we're going to design in all this new great cybersecurity for the future. But we have to figure out also how to protect what we currently have. And that's a big lift. So, so that's part of the problem. HDOs hang on to equipment for 10, 20 years. How old is your cell phone? And it's, you, you might be thinking, gosh, it's time to upgrade my cell phone. How about your car? How about any sort of, you know, earth moving equipment? You don't see anything 20 years old. All right. All of these tools should be cycled out and HDOs are trying to profit by not Cause, causing extra expense to acquire new products to phase out this. So you have a lot of this legacy out in the field that shouldn't be there. This is part of the problem. Uh, it really, I always encourage my clients to go through and to obsolete their product line. Don't let competitors do this and use part of this with cybersecurity. Come through and say, hey, this one now we can update this one. This last one was used that you're still using has EPROMs in it from 20 years ago. OK, we can't even buy those components anymore. All right. So how do you update them? You can't. All right? So there's all these things. And 20 years ago, we didn't think about this as an industry. We really didn't. OK, uh, I mean, I remember 2014 and the first pre-market guidance came as a shock to a lot of people. What do we do? How do we do this? And it's like, yeah, um, we need to approach this and start doing this. And I think to, to actually to Kevin's point, I think the medical device industry, because of the FDA, there's been some missteps like the first guidance, the pre-market guidance. But other than that, they, they got ahead of everybody else. Look at any of the other 16 critical infrastructures. I mean, the nearest one to us is automotive. There's some of them that are so far back, like oil and gas and, and NERC, you know, nuclear power generation and stuff, that they don't even know how to do this. They have no idea what's in their structures. We actually have got this huge running start 
the reason there's S bombs and we're talking about it was because of the FDAs. Okay, in their 2018 pre-market guidance draft, they started talking about it, and everybody wanted to know what this meant, and that got the ball rolling for NTIA. So, yeah, we are definitely ahead of everything, but we're not 20 years back. And for the HDOs that are hanging on to these products for this long, that's part of the problem. Well, and, and I'd agree there needs to be a partnership there, but I can also tell you that HDOs don't necessarily have the funding that you're indicating, right, to go ahead and replace everything that's out there, right? Small rural hospitals don't have Right. They run negative budgets. They don't actually make money in order to go ahead and, and replace their equipment. And so I agree there needs to be some middle ground as to when stuff needs to be upgraded and life cycled. But I think it's a little bit draconian to just say, hey, throw away everything you have and buy everything new every three years. I don't think that's a sustainable model either. We've got to find a middle ground. Or, or get a large crypto wallet going, because when that day comes for ransomware, you're going to need to pay it off. <laughs> I'm curious if this is a question of ultimately responsibility. Where are we assigning responsibilities when to these these different parties? And is it purely a question of, you know, do MDMs need to better understand what HDO, how long an HDO plans to use a device for? Are they supposed to be helping updates as as or as Chris is talking about, is there a hard cutoff and they need to help the and the HDOs understand there is going to be a hard cutoff? plan for it ahead of time, right? You know, is this about communication? Well, there are hard cutoffs and, the, and it and those occur, right? You know, we, mm. we end of life products all the time, right? And we get those notifications from our MDMs. But to your point, Brian, I think there is room for much broader communication around what is the life cycle, right? What What is the future plans, right? What is the path that, that we need to work with together to move forward? I think the communications between the MDMs and the HDOs can be Im improved in, in a vast number of ways, right? Ken alluded to it around even gathering requirements, right? You know, most of the IT and, and clinical engineering groups are never asked about requirements. And so, right, you're not even building a system with all the requirements, right, set out in uh, to start with. And so, right, I'm a huge proponent of, of additional channels of communication at all points in the life cycle, not only requirements gathering, but, right, feedback for vulnerabilities and SBOMs and everything else that we're going to talk about today. So there's another cycle going on in here as well. Been, I've been on this soapbox several times, which is um, – we are developing systems for which we know they will have long life cycles built on top of software that we know has short life cycles. Um, I mean, my previous life, I worked in commercial aviation and I helped design the flight deck of the Boeing 777. And it got certified in 1995. And I can assure you that airplanes that were built in 1995 are still flying today. We knew that the life cycle was 25, 30 years on it. There's not a Windows component on in, in the airplane. There's nothing that, you know, so there are solutions that are more stable, more long-lived. They're more expensive. They're a little bit harder to develop on. So the, the race to try to get the cheapest component because price becomes such a huge uh, purchasing factor drives behaviors that are not good for the industry. And we don't have enough as a way to assess that this one will actually work in 15 years versus this one, you're going to have support problems in five and have that factored into the purchasing price so that you can drive the security behaviors you need rather than just drive toward price. I mean, to an extent that goes back to what, what I said earlier when we talked about the life cycle, so that cybersecurity really has changed to a will need to change how we look at the life cycle. The examples you know, Sam was giving, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, five, 10 years ago, that was still perfectly acceptable because cybersecurity wasn't part of the picture and cyber risks weren't, were less of a problem. But nowadays, obviously, with cybersecurity and, and the overall you know, geopolitical situation uh, and cybercrime and, and ransomware and all those things, um, I think there needs to be a cultural change in how we look at life cycle and what is the useful lifespan of a device. And that cultural change then needs to translate into how hospitals manage pre-procurement planning, um, replacement planning, uh, procurement of new devices, but also, as um, Ken was saying, how device manufacturers design devices, make them future-proof, future less reliant on um, you know, things like like patching and, and replacement. Um, and then lastly, we also need to recognize that in parallel to this 
let's call it cybersecurity accelerator. We also have an ongoing technology accelerator that medical technology is changing at a faster pace than ever we've seen before. And I have hope that that technology accelerator will help us overcome the cybersecurity problem because that will actually force new devices in the market um, or actually devices in spaces where they have never been before, like remote care and, and, and you know, hospital at home models. Um, and I hope that we won't repeat in these scenarios the, the sins of the past by ignoring cybersecurity. Boy, I think you're dead nuts on there, Axel. I think that's that's an excellent way to sum that up. And it's like one of the problems we do as a medical device manufacturer is we think of HDOs as this monolithic thing. Well, they're not. I mean, you've got Mayo who's pen testing anything before it goes into their infrastructure, okay? And then you've got a hospital that's in Ohio that's the same guy who mows their lawns, sets up their IT infrastructure, and then everything in between, okay? And it's like, we're always thinking about this as, oh, it's the HDO. Yeah, well, okay, I could probably give my crappy, unsecure medical device to Mayo and they're not gonna take it, but even if they did, it'd probably be safe. But I'll guarantee you it's not gonna be safe at that Ohio hospital. So, well said, Axel. I think that's a, a good opportunity here to transition into ways to improve communication between parties. I, I, Something that was mentioned a lot when I was asking you as the panelists, you know, what, what do you want to talk about? Um, I heard about the there's a, a new white paper. It's specifically on model uh, model contract language for medical cybersecurity. This was released by the uh, the healthcare and public health sector coordinating councils. Um, some of you are on said councils. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you can raise your hands if you want. <laughs> Uh, I, I would want to hear a little bit more about that. You know, what, what problem is that trying to solve? And, and is it the end all or is it just the beginning? Well, I'll jump into this one first because I was on that working group. I joined it late, but I'm glad I did. It was very informative. Uh, it's, uh, it's a crawl, walk, run. I'm going to steal one of Josh Corman's phrases. Crawl, walk, run uh, approach to doing a template for HDOs to use in their contracts with MDMs. And it level sets expectations of what that ongoing relationship must be. To that end, this is a good version one. It is very much a living document. We have already started making notes for what that version two is going to look like uh, as we go forward. But it's a good crawl on our crawl, walk, run approach to implementing something new like this. Uh, we hope to get it in again. It, while this effort actually was a, a conglomerate of HDOs that started off, including Mail, by the way, um, it, it then converted into the Health Sector Coordinating Council under Greg Garcia, and it's not for Mail. <laughs> Mail's already got their good contract language. It's probably not for the guy in Ohio that's mowing the lawn, but it's for those other folks in between. We can start to set level set these expectations, make them common. This will make the, the MDM a little less scared when he sees these expectations. Well, initially, he's going to be scared, but then he's going to have to realize, maybe I can turn this into a competitive advantage. Because if these are the things that I have to hit, I know my competitors can't achieve this, then I can use this. But to do that, HDOs are going to have to start considering this kind of stuff pre-procurement. So the language that's in the contract and before they acquire that device, I mean, most of us are on HISAC. We see in the in the listservs where you'll have an HDO come up and go, well, we just bought these things. How do I test them that they're secure? It's like, no, no, no. Backwards, backwards. <laughs> test them <laughs> pre-procurement. Get in, Find out. Get in bed with them. Find out what their procedures look like. Find out how they're going to communicate to you. Convey all this. And that's what the template model contract language does. It's 45 clauses broken up into three major categories of how do you say, I, these are the things I need from you, medical device manufacturer, to go forward? Things like, what are, do you have any other backdoor passwords? What are they? How can you do remote communications into this system? All right, things like this, they're just fundamental. Do you have an S-bomb? So this will hopefully start to level set this industry and allow us to move forward in a nice lockstep. And when people get upset when they see what FDA requires, well, think what your, your customer base now needs, okay? The FDA stuff is pretty lightweight compared to what the actual industry that you're selling into wants to see. So yeah, it's only going to get more strict because these are the people who are on the front line. So it's it's the chicken and bacon breakfast. 
The chicken's involved because he made the egg. The pig's committed. OK, so the HDOs are the pigs. They're the ones out in the front line who, are, who are, they're getting their bacon roasted. OK, the MDMs were the chickens. Yeah, our stock prices may fluctuate. We may get some bad press. OK, but it's not that big of a deal. OK, a few 483s, few warning letters. Yeah, OK, we'll brush it off. We'll, get, we'll recover from this. But some of this stuff is really, really, really bad for the HDOs. So how do we come together and make certain that their expectations are being met? And something like the model contract language is, is the first attempt to do on this. Sam, do you want to add anything to that? No, Chris covered it fantastically. I think, right, as a message for all the listeners today, if you have not seen it and you are an HDO, you need to go pull it down off of the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council's website and you need to read it. And then you need to have a long conversation with your legal department and your supply chain department pre-procurement, just as Chris said, and you need to start holding your vendors accountable to this. You literally don't have to do anything but implement it. And in the HDO world, that never happens. So go apply it, right? And we're gonna be light years ahead, right? Uh, than other than other HDOs and right, to Chris's point, we're gonna drag the MDMs right into the into the 21st century. Well, and they're going to the, drag. Uh, they're going to drag themselves because they want the business. That's the beautiful part about it. It's not regulation. It's not a hurdle to overcome. It's we can get more market share. So we're going to run for this. Yeah. And from the manufacturer perspective, right, this should be appreciated very much because it standardizes expectations. Uh, rather than getting twenty-five different questions from every hospital you talk to, and everybody has reasonable and unreasonable requirements, you have one set of questions to deal with that was vetted by the industry and therefore is a set of reasonable requirements from a security perspective. So I was going to jump in on that exact topic, which is once upon a time, the latest version of MDS-2 was supposed to replace all of the extra questions that we have to ask from hospitals. And it just added more to it. And so I I would love it because that's the other side of it is the contracting side of it. And every hospital has their own information security agreement. I would love it if it would standardize. It would be fantastic, but I'm still skeptical whether the industry will align. And it might just become yet one other form you have to answer. So stay tuned. Well, we can only try. And again, it's a living document. And as we move it forward, I think the MDS2 is it gets a little long in the tooth between updates. Uh, I mean, it certainly has grown over the years from what was the initial one? 10 questions, I think it was something like that. Now over 300. Um, so it, it's, it certainly has grown, but not quick enough. So I think this stuff, like I said, we've already started on the next ones. And by the way, from some of it, from some comments like that were made by you, Ken, and by you, Axel, that were fed back into this. It's like, okay, we want to get this out the door and, and put a stick in the mud here at this point. But we really like your comments, and we're going to roll them into the next version. So, yeah, I, I, I hope I have good hope for it. I wanted to turn to Kevin Fu. You, you know, you've been quiet. I, I'm curious about um, the, the FDA. If if there is a place for the FDA in this conversation of, say, as as Ken pointed out, uh, you know, we want to standardize things. We we're hoping everyone will get aligned, get together. Does the FDA have any responsibility in in or or sense of responsibility in the fact that hey, we want more people involved in these kinds of uh, abilities or these kinds of conversations? Well, I think um, the the HSCC has already been brought up multiple times, and so I, I don't think I need to go too much into that other than mm -hmm. highlight, you know, there's a lot of interesting work going on with uh, codifying things like legacy devices, which is what this conversation is largely uh, circled around is how do you deal with legacy devices? Um, then there's the uh, IMDRF, which I don't think I've heard yet on this conversation. Um, I saw a little cringe motion over there, uh, but there's the uh, Inter uh, International Medical Device Regulators Forum. Uh, we meet uh, every two weeks, actually, uh, working on various um, documents uh, meant to bring more consistency to the different jurisdictions and countries around the world uh, pertaining, in our case, medical device security. So, um, for instance, there's a document called the N60 uh, defines uh, uh, some terms. Um, so for instance, if you want to have a better understanding of what legacy device means, there's a definition in there that I can paraphrase uh, as, as essentially being a legacy device is not only insecure, but it's insecurable in, in my view. So um, something that would be very difficult uh, post-market to correct uh, would, would be a, a legacy device. Maybe there's no way to do a software update. Maybe there, there are no patches for the third-party software. Maybe there is no updating mechanism. That's not a 
that's not a, a good sign, and, and that would be uh, a real red flag for being a, a legacy device. Um, there's also quite a bit of work going on with the IMDRF uh, involving uh, software bill of materials, so uh, SBOM. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's that's not a U.S. only uh, issue, although the, the U.S. has a lot of leading voices on, on SBOM. It, it's not just a, a U.S. issue. So it, it's an international issue um, for medical devices uh, and, and beyond. Well, I, I'm glad you brought up software bill and materials because we can transition over to that, you know, we were talking about understanding software bill and materials. For those who don't know what we're talking about, um, why is this important? Why is this important for the full life cycle of a device when we're, we're considering that between both parties? Well, I'll start this again. Um, I joined uh, the NTIA group under the auspices of the great and wonderful Alan Friedman, Dr. Alan Friedman, who did a wonderful job. That man herds cats better than anybody I know. And uh, he, uh, he, is, he ran this for four years under NTIA out of the Department of Commerce, this activity, before anybody knew what this was. Literally, there had been a mention of it in the, the, second dra the first draft of the 2018 FDA pre-market cybersecurity guidance as a C-bomb for cybersecurity uh, bill of materials. But it really, that was inclusive of hardware. And what, what we looked at is decided that there were some existing standards we could use that are machine readable. And the last thing the defenders need at HDOs is like text messages every day or the email every day or, hey, how about an Excel spreadsheet every day to you to tell you what the problem is? This is a system that is so big, that is so complex, humans can't be part of the solution. These things have to be automatically ingested in machine readable formats to communicate what is inside of your box. And completely. So I mentioned before Log4j, as did Axel, and we, we were talking about this, the transitive dependencies. So you have that first tier and you say, ooh, I included Log4j, but a real machine readable SBOM also includes all those 294 sub trans dependencies. And that way, the people who are the defenders in the HDOs can set their own appetite for risk. If they have an automatic system that can pull this up and say, hey, all those Acme ventilator company ventilator model 1000s you've got out there, okay, you have 105 of them, they are now at risk, okay? And this would be done automatically. And it's, it's because it's so beyond the scope of humans now. The other nice part of it, and, and the part that's less talked about, is the impact that it has on the MDMs. We as MDMs have lots of legacy in our background. Right? We don't know. I remember when uh, Sventooth, the Bluetooth Low Energy Vulnerability family of vulnerabilities came out. I know a lot of vendors spent a lot of time, I'm sure Ken can confirm this as well, going back through all their legacy products going, what Bluetooth Low Energy Radio did we use? What version of the stack? They burned lots of hours of, of engineer's time, expensive time. If, instead, if they had had S-bombs for all these products that they had done at a low priority task, they could have sit there and there's some great tools out there like Heimdall and all that for analyzing these things and comparing them to known vulnerabilities. You can ingest these S-bombs and use this to say, oh, we've got three products out there that we've created in the past that are susceptible to this. And then you can go out and you know make your JIRAs and start the process and kick it off to remediate these, inform your customer base, make your service disclosures, make everybody aware of where you sit on this whole thing. So these are some great tools because we had nothing to address the third-party software components. There are three places in the design lifecycle you create vulnerabilities. Design, implementation, and through the use of third-party software components. I hate the word soup, but what most people know is soup. Okay. We had good stuff for design, good stuff for implementation. We had nothing for third-party software components. So it's good for us as manufacturers. It's good for HDOs or anybody else who's interested in risk. And now because of the cybersecurity executive order, we got 15 other industries that also want to see this out there. And they're all clamoring for, clamoring for it. So great tools out there, both proprietary and, and open source, for creating, ingesting, using, comparing, good stuff. So I'll just summarize everything that Chris said. Why, why S-bombs? Number one step in cybersecurity is asset understanding. You cannot protect what you don't know you have. Yep. So That was a little too short, Ken. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a little too short. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do an hour-long panel here, Ken. 
I, I did want to go back. So me as the layman looking at this, and I go, okay, I, I'm thinking of this almost in the same way that I would get a notification from my car dealership when they realize that there is a, not necessarily a recall, but a problem. So, you know, your undercarriage is going to be corroding if you don't get it resealed within this time. We've, we found this out. Um, would that be a similar responsibility for H, uh, MDMs, HDOs? W where does the cost lie here when they do identify it? So one of the problems early on we figured out with S-bonds is there are vulnerabilities and there's vulnerabilities that are exploitable. Hmm. And the vast majority of known vulnerabilities, it's somewhere in the 80 percentile range, depending upon what study you look at, uh, is non-exploitable. So we were going to create a software bill of materials that basically said every piece of medical equipment you have in your organization <laughs> has vulnerabilities. Unplug them all right now. OK. In other words, completely worthless. All right. Um, so what do we do to do this? Well, we came up with this horrible term VEX, which was vulnerability exposures. And it, ultimately, we wanted another machine readable way for the manufacturers to communicate to the HDOs and say, we don't know this is under investigation no we investigated it and there is not a problem it can't be exploited or yes it is and then some subcategories under that like unplug it here's a workaround feed it into a wood chipper you know things like that uh, those are the kind of sub communications again all machine readable and there's now two formats that support this there is the csaf group uh, out of Oasis Open Standards, uh, which is a separate a JSON file. And then there's uh, Cyclone DX version 1.4, which including in your SBOM, because that's what S Cyclone DX is, you also have uh, a, a basically a vulnerability exposure statement by the medical device manufacturer, letting you know if this is something you should worry about. So you get the transparency of what's in it, but you also get an opinion from probably the people you admire the most. Now, who have certainly have the most information, but then this gets back to trust. Do I trust Acme Ventilator Company to tell me the right thing? I mean, you know, if this is Michael McNeil at, at McKesson, I'm gonna believe it, okay? I'll call out a good person, okay? Um, if, but if, you know, maybe it's Joe Blow at Acme Ventilator Corp, I, I may not trust what he tells me. So you have that vision into what's in the system, but then you can also come through and decide Am I comfortable with that or not? So use, useful tools. Well, and, and I'll double down on that. I, you know, I'll say that if it's a supported device that the manufacturer worries about, they're going to be the ones really to use the S-bomb to determine whether or not, right, they need to go looking for remediations. But those of us in HDOs, right, if, if a device is past useful life, right, mm -hmm. and, and written off by the manufacturer, Right. We have to we have to understand exactly what our risk is when these new vulnerabilities come out. And so this also gives us a tool to determine for stuff that's not supported. Right. Do I have a risk that I need to worry about? Right. And and to Chris's point, right, should I be feeding it to a wood chipper or can I continue to use something past end of life? Because in reality, it's not really that high of a risk. So there's tons of uses, regardless if you're an MDM or an HDO. Do you still use wooden medical devices from the 1800s? Uh, you know, I hate, uh, there are old devices in our healthcare system, I hate to tell you, right? You know, those of you that have not been to a, to a, a hospital in, in recent years, especially especially with COVID, right? We pulled out equipment that hadn't been used for years to try and get through COVID. Um, you know, there is risk out there and every healthcare system measures their risk a little bit differently, right? And so everybody needs to make that decision kind of for themselves. And <clears throat> That's one of the, the pluses I like about SBOM is that it's not a one size fit all kind of solution. It's a look at what you have, decide what your risk tolerance is, and individually make a decision. And, and the great thing about SBOM, uh, in my view, just personally, is that you know it's got so many different use cases. So at the procurement stage, understanding what risk you're basically buying into in the post market stage. You know, the next Log4j comes out, wouldn't it be nice that we're not just hair on fire? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Am I affected? And you just go, you just look, um, which is why it's so important, though, that an SBOM needs to be, uh, you know, reasonably complete, because if it chooses to exclude a particular package, well, what's the whole point? Uh, because this is about getting ahead of the game for unknown vulnerabilities. And so you need to be able to include enough uh, such that in the post market, you can you can capture that. Excellent, Kevin. Yeah, that's exactly right. And 
uh, we actually included the capability to say, all right, we got down to Barney's browser here, but we don't know what's beyond Bar Bar Barney's browser. So we have this way of saying, we don't know. OK, so again, it comes back and says we really don't know what its transitive dependencies are. Maybe it's closed source. Maybe we didn't get access to these. So we have something below it, but we don't know what that is. Again, trying to inform everybody so they can address that that whole thing. And one of the big problems with SBOMs these days are acquisitions. I just ran into this the other day on one of them. I was doing some research on ThreadX, a, a scheduler RTOS type uh, piece of code. And it was bought here two years ago by Microsoft. You can find nothing, nothing anywhere about it that's over two years ago. So when it was a thread X, there was like changed lists and logs and stuff of what occurred. And, and you can go back to it and see. So an older version of thread X before Microsoft acquired it, try to find something. I mean, it just, you don't see anything. You don't see anything out there as to what went on. So that's a challenge. Um, but those challenges will get better over time. Again, we're in crawl, walk, run here. We're just getting this put in place this year, but we're in pretty good shape for that. It, it does sound your, like it's a, oh, go ahead, Axel. Oh, um, back to your example, Brian, from earlier about the, uh, you know, your car and the, the rust problem and the undercarriage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is more akin, I think, how um, the medical industry managed recalls in the past, right, when there was traditional right you know, battery failures and, and broken leads and, and these kind of things. Those are failures that occurred at fairly low frequency and were statistically predictable. But you know that your ex of your customers may be affected within the next 12 months. Cybersecurity is an entirely different ballgame, and that is why we're talking about SBOM and I think many more things to come in the future to get a handle of this because cyber risk is non-statistical, right? I mean... Who knew about who knew how to spell log for J on December first last year, but by the thirty first we all knew how to spell it, right? And 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 therefore again, you know, S bomb yes is part of the solution, um, but because cybersecurity is so unique in its in its risk behavior, I think there's much more we need to work on in the future. Oh, don't think this solves everything in supply no. chain. It solves one little part. Uh, you start looking, there's about a dozen other points of vulnerability in the workflow for supply chain that other tools, other techniques, other things will have to be put in place. We're talking about, you know, walk, crawl, uh, crawl, walk, run. If we're still at the crawl stage right now, we're transitioning to the walk stage. I'm curious. What what is adaptation for this? You know, is is everyone on board with SBOM as at least as as, as step one, or is it really still a, a question of standardization? We've we've got to get adaptation still. Is that the call to action? I think everyone's getting on board because not only is it you mentioned in the executive order, but I believe there is a bill in front of Congress that uh, addresses some of the additional regulatory authority that the FDA is seeking and software bill materials as part of that. So it, it may become a, a legal requirement to produce these. So that, that, that aligns people very quickly. I think pretty much everybody is on board, right? I don't, I don't hear many people arguing against it anymore. I think what will be the struggle and, and uh, Chris pointed to that is to manage the complexity efficiently. Right. I mean, the, the number of devices a typical manufacturer has, each device has a number of versions. Each version has an XBOM of a given complexity, uh, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of components. Um, throw that over the fence to the HDO. They have thousands, ten thousands of devices on their network in different versions, and then all of a sudden need to match a single entry in some SBOM against their installed asset inventory which again is a challenge of complexity to begin with. So is SBOM the right path forward? It definitely is. Have we figured out how to manage that complexity efficiently and at scale? No, we haven't. And, so, and this is why, in, in my opinion, uh, why I share that sentiment, you know, SBOM's here. It's, it's the question is in what manner. Uh, but I think many of us know, many of us here have built products in the past, and, and some of the most effective products have this quality called incremental deployment, uh, and that you're able to slowly slowly ramp up as opposed to having a flag day. 
so um, I, I do think they're going to be uh, lingering questions on the, the best ways forward, and they're, they're likely going to be multiple best ways forward. And, and I think there needs to be uh, some recognition of uh, sort of a slow start um, as this becomes the, uh, uh, the, 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 the new way of life. Where, where is the SBOM process in terms of uh, aligning on nomenclature for the components? Because that's another area. Oh. Wrong. <laughs> so, <conclusion. laughs> so, Ken, <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of hard solutions. Um, naming is one of them. Is it MS Win 10? Is it Microsoft Win 10? Is it MS Windows 10 Pro? Um, and we have debated this endlessly. Th this is one of these... Uh, dead end black holes that these kind of working groups can can get themselves locked up into. Uh, and in point of fact, what we've seen from the proprietary tools that have been put on the market is they solved it quite easily. They created what's called an alias. And it's like, oh, OK, I've got here in my product MS Win 10. Oh, I've got this one that says Windows 10. OK, great. And it's like different builds, whatever, different versions. But you can you can go through and do it from a standards body yeah we don't have a lot of that but the, the really biggest thing that's missing because we have tools to create merge uh, basically convert between the two predominant standards which are cyclone dx and spdx we've got all of that in place what's missing is that asset management tool in the hdo uh, um, and one that can be addressed by the ohio hospital and one that can be used as well by mayo and everybody in between this has to be something that's cost effective that can be rolled out that they can actually do this correctly and so when i hear things like what you're working on ken with the hisac working group of you know being able to scan part of that is just identifying what asset do i have and if that's the first step to coordinating with asset management tools, and then they can easily ingest these S-bombs. So slowly, all of us in our different little sandboxes are putting together the pieces for this system to make what Axel's talking about, which is completely automated, completely hands-off, just telling you what you need to look at and what you don't need to look at on a daily basis. Then there's one other problem, though, and that is in addition to the ambigu ambiguity of software names within the, the world of S-bomb, there's an entirely different world, and that's the world of vulnerability databases, which yet use a totally different naming scheme. Yeah. Right? So the yeah. end exercise is to be able to match those two different worlds reliably. And and even those like NVD, I mean, they use CPE right now uh, to, to enumerate the name, but they don't want to use it. They want to move off it, and they haven't claimed where they're going. And then you've got a Google standard, then you've got Perl, then you've got all these different naming methods to make a machine readable naming system. Convertible between them, maybe. Certainly things like the aliases help with that. Yeah, and I believe CVSS names things that are vulnerable, but uh, SBOM has to go to things that could be vulnerable. Yeah. Cool. Sounds like we need to build up Skynet. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, I'll step in and say it, it's, it sounds like this is this is our call to action. Then is we, we need more people involved so that a consensus can be made. Uh, and there's been multiple groups that you're all part of that have been mentioned this whole time. So anyone who is watching this video, uh, take notes, think about uh, oh. contributing and joining. Uh, horribly remiss that I didn't give some URLs. NTIA.gov slash SBOM. That'll look at all the work that's been done for the past four years, all the use cases that were covered, all the edge conditions. Uh, Alan Friedman uh, left NTIA and joined CISA as supply chains are over there. And so he is starting up the new working groups under CISA. Uh, I believe we do have the CISA uh, slash SBOM site up as well now. Certainly also on LinkedIn, you can go through and search for SBOM and find it that way. Lots of good stuff to read, lots of good places to get started in uh, and, and figure out where you need to go for your SBOMs, if, if you're an HDO or an MDM. Fantastic. And you know, I'll ask the, the panelists all to, to send me some links afterwards that we might be able to include within the video description for anyone who wants to follow up on these sorts of things. Uh, and I'll also include some links to uh, the articles that many of you have written. Um, it, we're, we're coming on to time here, so I did want to wrap it up, but uh, please, if you're watching this, please keep in mind that call to action, get involved, get understanding of what's going on with what was discussed today. And uh, hopefully we can see that transition from crawling to walking to running. We want to be in full sprint as soon as possible, it sounds like. So uh, let's get that going. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, today for participating in this panel. And uh, I hope to do something like this again in the future. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks Take for care. having us.